under the direction of Osama bin Laden, bombed two American embassies in East Africa. The terror attack followed bin Laden's fatwa, or Islamic ruling, calling for a holy war against America. Like many young Muslim radicals, Atta was impressed by the Al-Qaeda attack. When one member of the prayer group complained to Atta that the United States was too powerful to confront, Atta disagreed. There are ways, he said. The US is not almighty. The men from Hamburg had decided their future. They put their personal affairs in order, wrote wills, and assigned power of attorney. There seemed to be a sense of wanting to get everything finished uh, to be ready. In a note to himself, Ziad Jarrah wrote, I come to you with men who love death just as you love life. Oh, the smell of paradise is rising. Their newfound determination would bring the Hamburg cell to the terrorist training camps of Afghanistan and face to face with Osama bin Laden. In early 1999, four students based in Hamburg pledged themselves to a radical holy war. Mohammed Atta, Marwan al-Shehi, Ramzi bin al-Shib, and Ziad Jarrah. These men would one day become known as the Hamburg Cell. This rare video shows three of the men at a friend's wedding. On the surface, they appear like any other guest. Jarrah sits cross-legged on the floor. Bin al Sheba makes a moving speech. And Al Shehi sings a song about martyrdom. But underneath their placid exteriors, the men were hiding a dangerous secret. The radical teachings they'd learned at Al-Quds Mosque had convinced them to become martyrs for their faith. Though they had no idea what their mission would be, it was only a matter of time before they joined the ranks of terrorists. By now, their association with religious extremists had come to the attention of German intelligence. This classified document is a record of a telephone call made in January 1999 between Hamburg cell member Marwan al-Shehi and a known al-Qaeda recruiter named Mohammed Zamar. The conversation was recorded through a top-secret German intelligence wiretap. On paper, the conversation seems harmless. They discuss the possibility of traveling in the near future. Government operatives thought the two men may have been planning to go to a terrorist training camp, but German authorities failed to act on their suspicions. They didn't investigate them very closely, and that's partly because they weren't out-and-out -out criminals, but it's also partly that um, there's a lot of tension between uh, European society and that portion of the society that's uh, Muslim. The laws in Germany are actually very favorable to religious organizations. Because of the Nazi past, Germans are panic-stricken at the idea that they could be um, accused of um, tampering with uh, religious issues. So if you're a terrorist and if you want to go to Europe, Germany uh, in particular was perceived as the sanctuary. As the Hamburg Four searched for a way to translate their violent ideals into action, Mohammed Atta was having second thoughts. Over the years, Atta had made several trips back to his native Egypt to look for work and visit his family. One of these trips was made in 1999. During that visit, 
Atta told his ailing mother that living abroad had made him homesick, that he wanted to stop his studies and return to Egypt to care for her. He knew, I think at some level, that he didn't want to go where he was going, and that by far the easier thing would be to be told to stay home, to come home. But his mother told him to go back to Germany, saying the most important thing for Atta was to finish his studies, maybe even go to the United States to get his PhD. When Atta failed to find a job in Cairo, he left Egypt and never returned. Back in Hamburg, Atta found work as a part-time draftsman for an urban planning firm. I believe this was a very difficult experience for him. For a long time, he felt like the people in Egypt didn't even need him. And I can imagine that black smoke inside him accumulating more and more and more, becoming thicker and thicker. Another member of the Hamburg cell, Ziad Jara, was also doubting his convictions. His girlfriend, Eisel, witnessed this struggle. She would uh, try to bring him back into the, the realm that she knew him in. And she saw it as a war between her and the religion for him. But her efforts failed. By late 1999, Ziad Jara, Marwan al Shehi, Ramzi bin al Shib, and Mohammed Atta would eventually find their way to Al Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan. Connections they had made through the radical Al Quds Mosque had convinced them that this would be an important step on their way to becoming martyrs. The men traveled individually to avoid suspicion. Bin al Sheib detailed their journey in this confidential interrogation record. One by one, they arrived in the Pakistani town of Quetta. Once there, they asked to meet a man named Al Masri. The name was a code signaling terrorist operatives to usher them across the Afghan border and into Al Qaeda's den. Officials of the radical Taliban government, who were working with Osama bin Laden, confiscated the men's passports and instructed them to pick assumed names. The men of the Hamburg cell had taken their first steps into the shadowy world of Al Qaeda. Facilities at the desert camps were spartan. Three or four makeshift buildings served as headquarters. Recruits lived in small tents. Ammunition was in short supply. Days began with a prayer, followed by several hours of physical training, running, weightlifting, and target practice. Their training was also part of a sophisticated sorting process that looked for skills useful to Al Qaeda. Especially prized were militants with advanced technical and language skills, like the men from Hamburg. When you get somebody like Atta and Ziad who speak perfect English and uh, in, in uh, German as well, they can mix with um, Westerners a bit easily. They are completely different caliber. In the eyes of Al Qaeda, they were the perfect men to lead a mission for their jihad. Shortly after the men arrived, they were summoned to Al-Qaeda's house of Gamdi in Kandahar. There, the Hamburg Four met Osama bin Laden and pledged their loyalty to him. Bin Laden then asked if they would accept a martyrdom operation. They agreed. The men had talked about becoming martyrs in a holy war for years. Now their moment had come. Bin Laden chose Mohammed Atta to be the leader of the group. Atta was a very focused guy he, and would do what he was told. Given a problem, he would work it through uh, and without distraction. 
The Hamburg Four were now assigned 